Hello again, and welcome back to my channel. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at protein structure and function. The main bits that we're going to be looking at are the elements which make up protein molecules, what functions proteins perform in cells, the building blocks of proteins being amino acids and how amino acids form proteins and what those amino acids actually look like. We'll also be looking at the four levels of protein synthesis, starting with the primary structure and then ending with the quaternary structure. We'll also look at the effect of heat on proteins and we'll also talk about how globular and fibrous proteins differ from each other. So let's have a look at this topic. So as usual, there will be a link to um, uh, an empty version of this worksheet, which I will be completing during this video. You can um, complete your version as we go along to keep as your notes. So on the first page, um, proteins are another very important group of biological molecules. Previously, we looked at lipids and carbohydrates. Proteins account for about 50% of the organic material in cells, and proteins are mainly made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And some also contain sulfur. As well as those five elements, there are various other elements which can be found in various different proteins which enable them to carry out their functions. So talking about functions, this diagram shows some of the functions of proteins in cells, as you can see there. I would like you to have a good look at that diagram and possibly pause this video and try to come up with five functions using the information provided in that diagram. You probably want to pause now. Okay, so you've had a, a, a stab at coming up with five different functions of proteins. Let's have a look at the five that I listed on the next page. So some examples of functions of proteins are listed at the top of this page. Um, they can be receptors for cell signaling. They can act as structural proteins. So for example, collagen in skin and as building blocks of tissues. They can act as transport proteins. So for instance, hemoglobin um, has a heme group attached to it, which enables it to bind to oxygen temporarily and transport oxygen around the body. Some proteins act as antibodies, and antibodies play a vital role in the immune response. And some um, proteins are hormones. So a lot of um, hormones are actually proteins. Some are um, lipid-based, but a lot of proteins. So an example would be insulin. And the job of hormones is to send chemical messages around the body. Okay. So we need to think about what proteins are actually made up of. So in the earlier topics, um, we looked at carbohydrates, which are made up of um, simple sugars, um, monosaccharides in essence, um, lipids, um, in the case of the main one um, that you would cover in the syllabus, uh, triglycerides, are made up of fatty acids and glycerol. In this case, proteins are made up of amino acids. Amino acids are interesting small molecules which can act as zwitterions. A zwitterion is, um, in essence, um, something that can act as a bit of a buffer. It can absorb hydrogen ions or give them up, depending on the situation. Looking at the diagram, you can see what an amino acid is made up of. It's made up of an amine group, 
which um, forms the first part of its name, amino acids. And it's also made up of a carboxyl group or carboxylic acid group, which is the other half of the name, acid. So amino acids come from those two um, groups within their structure. They also would tend to have a central carbon atom, which would be attached to a hydrogen atom, and then a variable group. The variable group is what makes one amino acid different from another. So in the simplest amino acid, methionine, the um, variable group is just a hydrogen atom, and then it becomes more complicated from then on. Mainly, or for the most part, um, organisms tend to make their proteins from 20 uh, amino acids. Definitely in us, uh, we tend to use 20. And in other forms of life, they also use 20 usually. But in some cases, um, they aren't the exact same 20 as our um, amino acids. They'd be very similar, but one or two might be different. So as I said, the variable R group, variable obviously, is what is responsible for making one amino acid distinct from another amino acid. Okay, so on to the next page. So with regard to the supply of amino acids, how are animals different from plants? So plants can make and synthesize all of their own amino acids. Whereas with animals, we ingest most of our amino acids, but can synthesize some. So what are um, essential amino acids from the point of view of animals? The essential amino acids are those which must be ingested. They cannot be synthesized within um, the cells of the organism. And this is part of the reason why um, you have to ingest a certain amount of protein every day because then you can digest the proteins from other organisms, uh, break them down and release and use the component amino acids. So what happens to excess amino acids in animals and why? So after we've broken down the proteins we ingest, we use the amino acids from those proteins to synthesize our own proteins. Now, um, at the end of that process, once we've made all of the proteins we need um, in a given period, say a day, um, whatever is left over must be removed from the body. And the reason why is because amino acids are actually quite small molecules and they're soluble. As a result, they affect the water potential of tissues and cells and so on. And so having them just floating around freely around the body can actually be quite detrimental. It can cause quite a lot of tissue damage and cellular damage. As such, any excess amino acids must be disposed of. So unlike a lot of other molecules, we don't store them. We make the proteins we need from them and then whatever is left over is removed. Uh, we keep um, part of the structure, which can then be used to make other molecules, but the main part that must be um, removed from the body is the amine group. And that is in essence turned into urea, which is a component of urine, and then is passed out of the body that way. So, as I said earlier, just as with um, carbohydrates, which had monomers, and the monomers in carbohydrates are simple sugars, in proteins, the monomers are amino acids, as I said. Now, as with um, carbohydrates, the amino acids are able to form bonds with each other by using condensation reactions. What is a condensation reaction? A condensation reaction, as we saw in our previous topics, lipids and carbohydrates, is a reaction in which a water molecule is lost in order to create a bond. Okay, um, 
So basically to reverse that process, you add a water molecule across that bond and that breaks it. So in this case, when, the, uh, when you have a condensation reaction between amino acids, as you can see in the diagram um, on that page, you end up with a new bond being formed and we call those peptide bonds. So if you have two amino acids forming uh, a molecule by condensation, you end up with a dipeptide molecule. And in essence, when you make that molecule, you make a peptide bond by releasing a water molecule, as you can see in that picture. So as I said earlier, the bond formed between amino acids is called a peptide bond. So the next step is looking at the structure of proteins, the different levels of structure of proteins. So the four levels of complexity are illustrated in that diagram. The first is a primary structure. The primary structure is the order or sequence of amino acids within a polypeptide uh, molecule. It is very specific to each protein. In essence, once you have the primary structure, every subsequent level of complexity is dependent upon that primary structure, and the primary structure in essence dictates all of the other levels of complexity. So what determines this primary structure? We'll talk more about this in another topic later on in the syllabus when we look at um, DNA and um, nucleic acids in general. But in essence, the order or, or the primary structure of um, a polypeptide chain, the order of the bases is determined by the order, I'm sorry, the order of the amino acids is determined by the order of bases in the gene which codes for that um, protein. So all of our proteins within our bodies um, are encoded, or their primary structures are encoded within the genes for those proteins. The next level of complexity is the secondary structure. Now, the secondary structure is um, how the primary structure folds in on itself. And when they fold, they form either an alpha helix or beta pleated sheet from the point of view of your syllabus. And as you can see there, a beta pleated sheet looks a little bit like um, those paper fans you would have made um, when you were younger. And those paper fans, by folding a piece of paper over and over again, form a sort of um, fan-like structure or an accordion, half an accordion type structure. And that's what a beta pleated sheet looks like. Uh, an alpha helix looks like an old style phone cable. So it's basically a coiled structure. The next level up is the tertiary structure. The tertiary structure is the three-dimensional shape formed by the folding of the polypeptide chain. In essence, broadly speaking, you end up with either a fibrous protein, which looks sort of linear, or a globular protein, which looks almost ball-shaped. The next step um, up is the quaternary structure. And quaternary structure only applies in proteins that are made up of more than one polypeptide chain, so two or more polypeptide chains. An example of that would be hemoglobin. Um, hemoglobin is made up of four polypeptide chains, and as such can be described as having a quaternary structure. Anything with just one polypeptide chain within its structure cannot have a quaternary structure. It is in essence um, stopped at the tertiary structure stage. Next, a prosthetic group. So prosthetic groups are non-protein 
um, species or molecules added to a protein in order to give it a function. An example would be heme or iron in hemoglobin. The heme or the iron is what enables the hemoglobin to bind temporarily to oxygen in order to transport it around the body. So some examples of the sorts of bonds or interactions which are responsible for bringing about the um, secondary, tertiary and quaternary structures are shown in that diagram. You can have things like ionic bonds, you can have um, interactions like hydrogen bonds or van der Waals forces. You can even have some covalent bonds like disulfide bridges and so on. All of these interact with each other to give a protein its shape. And that shape is vital to the function of the protein. Proteins work based upon their shape. So, let's think about what happens when the shape of a protein changes. So, one way in which um, this, or in fact the main way in which a protein shape might be altered, is by applying heat. What is heat? Heat is basically a representation of energy. And the energy from the heat causes the molecules and atoms to vibrate eventually that can begin to break bonds and the breaking of those bonds alters the shape of the protein which could therefore alter um, the way in which the protein works in some cases it might make the protein more effective in some cases it might make it less effective it all depends on the situation with that protein Eventually, if enough heat is applied, enough bonds are broken within the structure that the protein can no longer function. At which case, um, at which point, once it can no longer function and it can, and that damage can no longer be reversed, it's described as being denatured. The application of heat does not necessarily lead to a protein being denatured. Denaturation is a specific term. It applies to a protein that has had its, its shape changed so significantly that it cannot return to its original shape, at which point it is described as being denatured. So simply heating a protein and changing its shape a little bit does not denature it necessarily. It only becomes denatured at the point where that alteration cannot be reversed. So what's the difference between a globular and a fibrous protein? As you can see in the picture, on the left you've got a fibrous um, protein, collagen, and on the right you've got an example of globular protein, hemoglobin. The fibrous protein is more or less linear, it forms linear fibers. They tend to be used for structural molecules, basically molecules that um, confer a structure or strength to a tissue or um, a cellular component or, and so on. Whereas globular proteins are often described as being functional, they perform um, very, very specific functions within the body. So for instance, um, hemoglobin transports oxygen around the body and hemoglobin is an example of a globular protein. Another example of a globular uh, of globular proteins um, would be um, certain enzymes for instance. And so that's basically it with regard to the main content um, of the topic. As usual with these worksheets, there are a few examples of past questions which you might want to have a look at to see if um, you have a good understanding of the material that's been um, covered. Another really useful way to use these worksheets is to actually um, keep blank versions of them and see if you can refill them from memory.
and you keep doing that until eventually you can successfully refill um, a blank version of the worksheet purely from memory without having to look back at any notes. And so let's have a quick recap of what we've um, covered so far. So we looked at um, protein structure and function. We started off with the fact that proteins are mainly made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, along with some other elements like sulfur. We then went on to talk about some of the functions performed by proteins in organisms. So for instance, some proteins act as transport um, substances like hemoglobin, some can be structural proteins like collagen, um, some can act as enzymes, some can be hormones, and so on and so forth. So they perform lots of different functions in organisms. All proteins are made up of simpler building blocks called amino acids. And amino acids are made up of various sections within them. You've got the amine group, which is an NH2. You've got the carboxyl group, which is a carbon with a double bond to an oxygen atom, and another single bond to another oxygen atom, which is itself um, bonded to a hydrogen atom. That's a carboxylic acid group, which gives the acid part of the name to the amino acid. You then have a central carbon, which is attached to a hydrogen atom, and then it's attached to what we call a variable R group. That variable R group is the only part of the structure of an amino acid which distinguishes one amino acid from another amino acid. The simplest um, amino acid is methionine, in which that variable R group is a hydrogen atom, and then it becomes more complicated from there. The next thing we looked at was um, how amino acids bind to each other and they bind by using a series of condensation reactions. And as I said earlier, condensation reactions are reactions in which a water molecule is lost in order to make a bond. Now the bond formed by the loss of that um, water molecule um, between amino acids is actually called a peptide bond. And that's why the um, molecules made up by a series of amino acids being bonded to each other are described as polypeptides. Okay, let's have a look at the next bit. So the next bit was the um, four main levels of protein structure. So increasing complexity of um, protein structure. We start off with the primary structure, which is the order of amino acids, which is determined by the base sequence in the gene coded, uh, the gene which codes for that polypeptide chain. The next step up is the secondary structure, which is how the primary structure folds in on itself to form either an alpha helix or beta pleated sheet. Then you've got the tertiary structure. The tertiary structure is in essence the three dimensional shape formed by the folding of a polypeptide chain. And you will either end up with a fibrous protein as with collagen, or you could end up with a globular protein as with hemoglobin. And then the final um, level of complexity is the quaternary structure. And in the quaternary structure, um, it only applies to molecules or proteins which are made up of two or more polypeptide chains. So you can only um, talk about a quaternary structure in proteins that are made up of more than one, so two or more polypeptide chains. And an example of that would be hemoglobin, which is itself made up of four polypeptide chains. The next thing we looked at were prosthetic groups. So prosthetic groups are non-protein groups added onto a protein to confer a function. 
So um, an example would be heme or the iron group added onto hemoglobin, which enables hemoglobin to bind temporarily to oxygen so as to transport oxygen around the body. And then we finished off by looking at the effect of heat on the shape of a protein or polypeptide chain. Heat is a representation of energy which can be added onto uh, or added to a system in which you've got a protein and that causes vibrations of the um, component um, atoms, molecules, amino acids, whatever within the protein. And eventually those vibrations become so rigorous or um, so often that the um, bonds between those structures begin to break and slowly you end up with an alteration in the shape of the protein. As I said during the um, lesson, this can lead to a protein being denatured, but denaturation is a very specific term. Denaturation means that the protein has been so significantly altered that it cannot return to its original shape, at which point it might lose functionality. So that's um, basically what we've covered in this lesson. If you found that useful, please feel free to um, press the like button um, at the bottom and also you can subscribe um, and press the bell icon in order to be notified of my future videos. I'm hoping to add a few more videos over time to help with um, people who might be struggling with their A-level and GCSE biology um, syllabuses. So, that's basically it for me for this lesson. As I said, do remember to um, try to fill in the blank version of the worksheet. Probably um, it would have been helpful to actually have downloaded that prior um, to the lesson so you could have filled it in um, as you watch the video, but actually that's, you could just watch the video again and uh, go through it that way. So good luck and see you in future lessons.